today's room is such grass. Today's room is such grass, which is uh, safety, safe refuge, safe harbor, and protection. I've come across some people and their dogs jump all over you. Um, it's not really the dog's fault. Dogs are very revealing. Actually, dogs reveal a lot of truth. Sometimes, you know, the dogs are just happy to see me because they haven't seen a real person in a while. They're honest. And thankfully, their, their behavior is open to, to interpretation. A misinterpretation. Sometimes dogs bark at me to protect uh, me from their owner. Other times it's not necessary because you can tell the owner is evil. tending dynamic. I've met two different men who look exactly the same and who live 10 miles apart, whose dogs were different breeds, who make way too much eye contact with me. It's the owner, it's not the dog.
The ninth letter is the letter I. And the ninth number is the letter I. And the ninth letter is the number nine. It's kind of interesting, huh? That the letter B is the number two. Is the letter B. That a W is the first letter of the word war, and word, and world, and work. And the letter B is the first letter of bull, and Bible. Excuse me. Now we have a word in our history that has all those numbers in it. Nine one one, which itself adds to the number eleven. The two eyes of the bull. And then the other two eyes of the bull. And the number three four times. Nine plus two is also eleven. Nine plus eleven is twenty or two. Eleven minus nine is two. Between nine and eleven is ten, which is two.
you look at the first two letters of the word Bible, it's the number two and the number nine. Two, nine, two, which is eleven, eleven, which is the name of God, built right into the first three letters of the Bible. And you get the number three and five, the difference of which is two. And the total sum of all of which is the number 10, which is also the name of God, between the numbers 9 and 11. It's pretty well organized, isn't it? Anyway, 9-11 is the Bible. As I said in the previous video, it had a little nose coming out of the building. Which was the nose. Nose. Alarms are being sounded from the mine, but they're suppressed. You don't tell a great lie in any other way, but to make it as big and bold as possible and create circumstances where people turn off their silent alarms. For instance, when the two planes in 9-11, or three or four planes, were circling around Washington and Pennsylvania and whatnot, and we were watching them on TV, a lot of people had silent alarms. The first thing that I remember thinking, watching this coverage, the first critical thought I had is, why are these planes being allowed to fly in the sky so long? but it was really setting up the plot. 9-11 should have ended with uh, three planes crashed or were shot down and uh, life goes on. It's exactly textbooks why you would shoot down a plane that was commandeered by terrorists who planned to take into the city. I mean, you think they didn't plan for this? You think they didn't have war games and contingencies for someone taking a plane and wanting to run it into America? It was all, the plot was already set up. Then they just had to fill in the blanks and tell us the story. First thing was, why aren't they intercepting these planes? It's like an alarm goes off. And then no announcers say, boy, that's very odd, considering we're at the most advanced, sophisticated, and fearsome level of security and defense systems in the history of the world for the most important political place on the entire geopolitical map. We've got trillions of dollars of software and engineering and training and equipment, and we can't, like a couple old people walking around in the most protected airspace in human history. And the military is just going, gee, sir, we don't know what to do. We haven't planned for this contingency. You know, because that's what the military's like. They're always caught on their ass wondering what to do, right? <laughs> that's that's what the country's defended by. Some some fucking fat bureaucrat can tell them not to do their job. Now, I mean, it's pleasing to think that the United States government doesn't just go around shooting down commercial jets but uh i mean that's good too you know <laughs> governments can never get a break i 
mean, you could just send a bunch of fighter jets on either side of them. You'd think that guy, you know, they're not going to land. I mean, they're already terrorists. They're already willing to kill themselves and other people. So, I mean, you got to cut your losses. You can't just talk to them and hope they land safely. They don't even know how to land. Maybe they've already killed the pilots. Maybe the best thing to do would be to shoot it at the sky. These people would die quickly. I hope one hopes. You know, put every fucking side widener you can into it. And, you know, people... I've watched TV. People blow up. They don't live. And all those fictional characters would just rain from the sky. Like those fictional planes falling onto... That nobody heard on the day of 9-11. You know what, uh... Jet engines sound like when they're moving over 200 knots near sea level, which is not even possible, actually. But do you know what the sound it would make? It'd be like standing at three different rock concerts in the front row at the same time. Not a single person in one of the most densely populated cities in the United States ever reported hearing a plane. silent alarms. But I appreciate um, a guy named Fritz Springmeier, a bit of a weirdo, but he got up at some conspiracy con and suggested, you know, looking at the numbers, he's all into like, you know, the Illuminati torture mind control people, so he looks like he's been mind controlled himself. But he talks about the numbers of the flights and things like that. I thought that was really interesting. It's all about the numbers, right? <coughs> Making all their cell phone calls. Because you know cell phone calls. Well, I mean, maybe now. Probably not then. Making a cell phone call at fifteen to 30,000 feet is not always the easiest thing to do. But it is the New York area. I mean, they must have a lot of fucking cell towers and shit. But uh, and that's not that's not a point I'm willing to die on. But um, there's just a lot of difficult elements to believe about the whole thing. But you don't really need that much. You know, people will put the story together themselves. They'd rather have a story that they know than a story that they don't. Ameri 250, 500 million Americans are not going to go. I just don't know what happened at all. Planes, phone calls, buildings. I'm just not sure. I haven't reached any conclusions. 9-11. <laughs> what if it was like 9-12? What if it was the next day? We called it 9-10. And people are like, wow, it's a good thing it's not 9-11. Boy, you'd never get that out of your head. And there was an attack in, I think it was London, 777, they called it. There was a pretty good documentary on that, too, involving these allegedly uh, terrorist bombers in, uh, in London. Right down to the advertising on the side of the buses that were blown out. It's like nothing is wasted. Like it's, well, a lot of people say it's staged. There was an excellent documentary put together about Sandy Hook but you'll probably never see it. And maybe it's just as much a gibberish as everything else. But the point is to ask questions.
11 is basically like also LL. It's basically Ella Ella. And then there's the letter I. So it's basically Ella Ella Ella. Jesus says, Abba, Abba, number two, why have you forsaken me? Why hast thou forsaken me? Sorry. I would like to put an ass in there somewhere. Forsaken me. Forsaken me. That's one of the most troubling questions in the New Testament. When Christ dying on the cross, suffering cruelly, if we're to believe the story. Body parts dislocated, nails through his body, bleeding, stomach. You have to sit up on your fucking dislocated ankles in order to fucking breathe, and then you have to collapse and enable you to breathe properly. This basic desire to live, fighting with the desire to die. After being humiliated, flogged, God knows what, in public, paraded around like a pariah, like a useless waste of garbage that doesn't deserve to be treated like a human anymore, and then nailed to a cross. That's what God, now look at this people, you've been looking at it for centuries, that's what God does to his son. And he says, hey, look at this everyone, I'm your great daddy in the sky, this is what I do to my children. When they're perfect. This is what I do to my children when they are without sin or debt, when they owe me nothing. They're my favorite. This is what I do to them. And I do it because of you. For you. For you. I do it all for you. And you're like, what? I don't know how to respond to that, Daddy. Jesus didn't do no wrong. <laughs> Please tell me, Daddy. What are you talking about? Instead of going, oh, wow, I get it. That's like, whoa, thank you. That's just pure love right there. Like, you know, when I think of love, I think of, uh, you know, 120-pound uh, Jewish men being tortured on a cross after being raped and beat the shit out of in public like a piece of garbage. That's love, eh? Oh, I love your love, Christians. God, that just fucking swells my heart and warms my dick. And don't forget that God abdicates paternity in the New Testament. So he's not even his real son. He says, Dad, Dad, why are you doing this to me? He fulfills the whole thing of Isaac. You know, it's like, Dad, now he's older. We go, hey, what the fuck are you doing? Now, this would make a, you know, a, a, a very suspenseful story on Telemundo. But now it's in the mind of billions of humans and they think the absolute quintessence of love and logic and logos and ontos and everything else is in this dude dying on a cross symbolically mythically historically in every possible way i mean the blood dripping from christ's asshole with something that they would basically lick if they thought it would get them closer to god everything is holy about it you could go suck his dick while he's like, you know, you could go eat his fucking testicles off the cross. You'd be helping him because the more torture you give to Christ, the better it is because you're just cleansing. You're cleansing the human race with murder, with torture. You're cleansing them, right? And maybe you would cleanse me that way. Oh, no, because Jesus did it for you. He didn't do it for me, motherfucker. I don't ask people to do that for me. If some fucking daddy in the sky says, hey, Rain, I did this for you. I say, fuck you, you piece of shit. Fuck you and your fucking threats. Fuck you. I'd be like Conor McGregor. Like, you're going to do nothing. You're going to do nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you know, bullies, cowards, they kind of all go together. It's not even worth it, is it? It's a big fucking paper tiger. What's it all for? You have 
have to worship God having turned off your silent alarms. You see? The Christian can't hear any of those things. Ever, 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 ever. They cannot listen to what I'm saying. You cannot ever preach it to them because they're in a cult. They can't possibly see it any other way. You're like, Rain, can you see life from any place from you but your own bathtub? Can you imagine a life where this wasn't something that was useful for a human being to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's like one billion people who have something much, much fucking better to do today with children and lives and jobs and all kinds of things they can serve the human race with. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm all into logic, man. But remember, it applies to everybody. You're not going to add hominem your way out of this, fucking Christians. Fucking cowardly pieces of shit. Pitiful bastards. Let's put some New York in there, you bastards. <laughs> 9 11 bastards. I hate the 9 11 bastards. Don't take away my pizza. Bastards. If I was in New York on 9 11, like, you fucking bad. By the way, I, shit happened. I mean, people died, right? It's like, shit. Fucking not fair to New York. Not that they're really complaining anymore, but. Such a combination of magic and violence and the real and the imagined and the fear of human beings. I mean, you think that people can't run the world like a giant zoo? There's a lot of confidence there. Perfect Hollywood explosions. It's really something. I'm not even saying that you have to say that the people who planned and executed 9 11 are completely evil human beings. I think there's something, there's a third road here. I mean, we're, we're used to good and evil being on TV. One of the ways I think they protect themselves is by forcing us to divide up the world into good and evil. Not that that's not very useful in its way, and I do it quite often myself, but as I suggested in earlier videos, the people doing 9-11 aren't in fact doing it because they're stupid thugs. This isn't about money. I don't even think it's about power or anything like that. These people control the world already. What if they're doing it for conscientious reasons that they don't think we'd understand? saying the buildings on 9-11 were built and the only way they could be built if they could be demolished by small nuclear weapons that were already under the bedrock they were the all the installation was already set up that's why the one building went down before the other right there were two buildings hit by planes allegedly <laughs> doesn't mean it didn't happen i'm just saying that so we can keep our minds open I can't remember if it was the South Tower or the North Tower, you know, it's been, over, you know, South, North, North, South. And the one that was hit first falls the last. Which is, you know, okay, you know, you got kerosene fires and shit, like, it's chaos. I mean, you wouldn't want it to be too logical, would you? But it's fascinating, isn't it? Considering what's considered to have constituted their collapse, rare in itself, and not only, like, a very improbable type of a collapse, very improbable collapse, a very improbable type of collapse, and in two separate identical buildings within within like 20 minutes of each other, based on like the most improbable thing of all, not only being hit by one jet airplane, but each one being hit by jet airplanes, filled with fuel. Boom, 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 boom. Boy, that's a lot of probabilities. If you were a mathematician, what would you think the likelihood that that could all happen on the same day and that day would be 9-11. Let's do the math on that. Let's go buy some lottery tickets. And not only 9-11, but on a day where the two buildings actually represent a giant number 11. In fact, the whole block is down, so another building three, and then all together, I think seven or nine, at least seven buildings were destroyed that day. But nobody talks about it. There's so much destruction. You don't get some 
black or white person on TV go, my car was down the block and it was turned to a lump of fossilized lava. <laughs> but there's people in court filing insurance claims because the mailbox that they put their um, letter in were destroyed. They, that means that the terrorists destroyed federal property and you're going around the Middle East trying to find them so you can incarcerate them. <laughs> For the most minuscule crimes. <laughs> you destroyed my mail, you motherfucker. That's a crime. It's a felony. You destroyed mail. Osama bin Laden should have just found a mailbox and said, ah, I just started lighting it on fire. <laughs> there you go, America. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Maybe he went overboard. Maybe that's how it started. We won't just take the mailbox, guys. We're going to take the entire fucking block. In all the mailboxes. <laughs> That's like a thousand felonies right there. What if Osama bin Laden went home to his dad and said, Um, dad, I think I did something. <laughs> He's like the king of Saudi Arabia or something. He's like, It's all right, son. I'll just make a phone call. <laughs> Hello? Mr. Bush? Not the young one, the one that was in charge of the CIA. I need to talk to you. Like, what you doing over there? What you doing over there, your country? My son is blameless. He is without sin. Well, Osama bin Laden looks a lot like Jesus, actually. We should have fucking crucified him. I don't think by the time Osama bin Laden was killed that people really hated him. He didn't seem like a very hateful dude. I think people hated Bush more than Osama bin Laden, to be honest with you. You know, the enemy you know, you don't know Osama, you don't know what to hate about him. There's no malice there. And he's on dialysis, ISIS. Dial Isis. Dial Isis. Dial Isis. Dial the number 11. There's an emergency. What if I said? Isis is the dog star, which is the celestial body of the earth, or the mother, the number of the mother, whose name God takes twice and makes it the name of all violence. Knowing you, knowing me, uh -huh. there is only one, two, three, knowing you. <clears throat> I don't make appropriate hand gestures, I'm sorry. My body doesn't work properly, so sometimes when I love people, I just sit there across the table and go, and they're like, what are you doing? I'm making this up, of course, but I don't know. This is a perfectly good finger. It's my longest finger. That's how much I love you. <laughs> I love you this much. Every child in the world goes, Daddy, why is this bad? <laughs> Does this do something to you? This? What about this one? What does this one do? What about this one? Dad? And then immediately like, oh, sorry, Dad. <laughs> it's like, Darn, that bodily gesture just feels evil. It's amazing. God, and Adam, you shall never use your little finger towards your sister. <laughs> He's telling him not to finger his sister, and yet when you consider what he does to his sister, it's like, um, Dad, you gave me a natural desire for the female flesh of my lovely sister. Adam is like William Wordsworth. <laughs> oh, she is lovely as the summer breeze. <laughs> oh, come on, little me, game on. La, na, 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 na. <laughs> he was probably gay, you know? He's probably gay. The only thing that balances it out if it's Adam and Eve were both gay. You know? They only did it because they had to. They did it to save the human race. The most important thing at all. You know? What if Adam and Eve both were like, were off by themselves? It's like, brother, sister, I have an 
idea. So do I. What is it? It's all so beautiful. There must be some... I feel something bad is going to happen. I don't know what. So I think we should have sex. That'll make it okay. <laughs> you know, it's very theatrical, right? They think they're saving the world, but they're actually creating all the problems. And then there's like some Louisiana psychic that looks like Oprah on steroids. It's like, you're going to bring death into the world. You think it's beautiful? It's not. It's going to crack. And you're going to die. <laughs> you really dress it up. I mean, the Bible is very boring. Let's get some serious theater going on here. Let's have planes hitting tall mountains. Leaving devices that have to be found by black military operations. <laughs> Adam and Eve are like, what is this nonsense? What if they're out there right now? What if Adam and Eve are living on the earth? Maybe they're watching this. They're like 50,000 years old each. Sister, he makes me want to share with him the secret of eternal life. No, we can't do that. You know, we agreed to that many, many years ago when we were watching the Visigoths. Chronic masturbators shouldn't live too long. <laughs> You're right. Ah, uh, history has given us so much knowledge, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Now let's stand back and listen. We shouldn't intrude into this man's thoughts too much, or he might be able to live forever and dwell among us. It's like now I'm plagiarizing the Bible. That's great. Come on, God. Come and get me. Come and get me. You still love the world that you gave your misbegotten, illegitimate son to make people think that your name is only appropriately spelled by wreaking hell and high heaven upon the delicate and vulnerable mind of a completely innocent man. This gives you some idea of what God thinks of you. And yeah, here we are. Where's God? Where's Jesus? Where's Waldo? You know? Maybe people like finding Waldo because at least there's like, they can't find Jesus. They have nothing like find Jesus and you turn the pages, you know? There's like two outhouses at a Grateful Dead concert. He's kind of peeking out from underneath. <laughs> <laughs> I think to me Christianity was created just to make me laugh, you know. It's hilarious. Where is Jesus? Where is he, Jesus? Jesus could be the thing. Where is he? Where is the motherfucker? Hey? Eh? You say he's coming back sometime? Right? You watch Fox News and you think it's happening? That somehow in the signals of Fox News the approaching return of the Lord is somehow made clear to the faithful. I mean, and you think I'm a schizophrenic. Jesus ain't coming, man, because he ain't ever here and he never left. He's in your mind. And the only thing Jesus was for was to change your fucking mind. Right? He's coming in your mind all the time. He's coming up your ass and out of your fucking neocortex every fucking day. It's a rain of bullshit. It's an old faithful of bullshit. It's a 9-11 for the human race. It turns off your silent alarms. They call it the Holy Bible because it's full of holes. It's even interesting that we use the word whole in a holy book. Like the word whole itself. I mean, there's Bugs Bunny. There's the hole that prisoners are put into. There's glory holes. There's the asshole. How many sacred holes do you know about? It's not like humans are like, whoa, I found this really sacred hole, everyone. Let's go to the hole. I guess you could call it a cave. What is a hole? A toilet bowl? That's a toilet hole. And it's a holy Bible. 
you know? What makes it, what does the word holy mean? Whole? The, you know? Why would you have, why wouldn't you have whole, the whole Bible? It's like the whole Lord of the Rings series. Holy. Particularly what? Infinite, eternal, powerful. Right? The adjectives I guess you're supposed to use are supposed to be superlative with all that is eternal and powerful and valuable and sacred beyond all measure. Is that it? That's what this shit is? <laughs> then why don't you fucking say that? Why don't you say, hey, this is the book that's valuable and sacred and infinite and knowledgeable and pure and righteous and supernatural in every possible fucking way. And you should just study every fucking letter and smell every fucking page and sniff and eat, boil down the fucking glue they used to put the fucking pages together and shove it up your ass like a divine fucking suppository. That's how fucking amazing it is. If you actually um, distilled uh, all of the ink from all the Bibles in the world, to me that would be the most deadly chemical in human history. Just think of that shit. Now, as a thought experiment, take away all the Bibles of the world and see how human would have behaved over the last 300 to 500 years. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Christians could scarcely imagine a more important influence over the human race, and yet would never wish to uh, impugn the infinite reputation of the Bible by suggesting that it persuaded people to be more violent than they might have otherwise needed to be. If anything, it provides a basis for human violence and predicts that humans could be infinitely violent. No matter what the Bible has ever given to every level of faithfulness anyone has ever put into it, nothing about it was to do anything more than predict at biblical proportions of human violence. Every Christian could be completely satisfied with the level of violence which has attended the birth of their holiest, most wonderful, infinite knowledge and God. Which is somewhat suspicious in itself, isn't it? It's not a book of peace. In fact, in the Bible, and I mean, it has a lot of different sources, you know, of different levels of credibility. And not every single line is known exactly that this was the line it was meant to be. That's just a fact. Uh, but Christians probably don't like that idea. And um, in one of the earlier versions of the Bible, it says, goodwill to all our brothers and sisters, goodwill to all Christians. It's not goodwill to all mankind. But to do goodwill only to people who are like you and believe these words and are among the faithful. Now, the faithful are actually defined in the book of Romans as the owners and authors of the Bible. Those who can never be unfaithful to God by definition. Never unfaithful to God never unfaithful to God. That's, to me, the boldest statement in the entire fucking book. And no preacher ever talks about it. And that tells you that these people fucking know what they're doing, man. They fucking know. This is like lawyers and the X-Men getting together. Like I said, like why would, why would any terrorist organization attack a country with the most amount of lawyers in human history. Forget our Pentagon and our defenses. It's the lawyers that really defended America. I mean, Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. If you had like a, a bunch of houses on your street with judges and lawyers from all kinds of incredible schools and what, you gonna start fucking flinging slander and libel at these people? No. You're not going to get away with anything. They're going to get theirs, and then some. They're going to take your house, your land, your people, your children, your language, your Bible. 
then a hundred years are going to go by and they're going to do it again forever. They're going to own you. They're going to own every fucking grandchild that ever comes out of your fucking wombs forever. They're going to take everything. You know what I mean? And that's what's happened to human beings. We've been taken. We just don't know it. The Bible and God is a barcode on human DNA and all of our lives. But even then, it doesn't mean that it's entirely evil. In fact, it's much more useful to think of it as morally ambiguous. Because anytime you think in group psychology, you can't expect to think in a way that's completely satisfying at an individual level. People in history are not acting like individuals. We have individual heroes, we have Galileo, in which we're not even accurately told about Galileo. He wasn't saying that the earth moves around the sun. He was saying that the earth moves at all, like compared to me sitting here in my head going like this. He was saying that it has, like, it shows some physical changes in its location in space due to, like, the heavenly spheres going around it. That, that was the abomination. He was saying that there was actually something wrong with the universe as people understood it. There's something imbalanced in the universe. And he's the only one who got away with saying it, and look what they did to him, killed him. He was unfaithful. It's just a story, but what is it really programming you to think at a subconscious level? It's got the word lie in the middle of its name. Okay, you got Galileo, then you got the man from Galilee. Which is almost the same thing as Galileo. Hmm. And he happens to fix you in space at the center of history, the number zero, the birth of Christ, that never moves and everything revolves around it. Do you, do you see how everything revolves around the number zero in human history? And that's the sun of the universe of Western civilization. The Son of Jesus Christ. So the guys that make uh, um, Zeitgeist sell it, they're not going to tell you that. They're not going to go that deep because they work for the same government. <laughs> this is giving you a bunch of fucking neo pagan mumbo jumbo. And you're like, Jesus isn't the Son, it's actually an, a solstice. <laughs> and that's all, again, all, all very interesting. Look at the universe that we're talking about here. Zero becomes the central hub of history. You can see quotes throughout history. Jesus is the center of history. Famous historians have said this. I know that my mom used to have this giant book of quotations and I'd sit depressed in her living room and just flip through it. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for meaning. <laughs> you know? That's better than the Bible. Just give children a book of quotations. I mean, just fuck, that's interesting, right? Why not, right? Why not? Stimulates the mind. And that's the one that steps out at me the most, that Christ is the center of history, otherwise history would not make any sense. Hello? Hi. My mom. Yes, of course. Sorry. Um, you were interrupted by my mother's bladder. Hail, the wonderful mother. Um, you'll see. Um, So the number zero is the hero, is the sun, is the center of history. The number zero, which has the word love in it, eros. Zero is eros. It is love. We should be doing this, we should be doing like this. Love is a whole at the center of time around which everything revolves. It is a sacrifice. 
It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. Elton John, baby. It was this, I'll call it a gay Starbucks. I guess it was pride. Hey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't sound so bitter. <laughs> I came into the Starbucks and I'm on Pride Week or Pride Month. And it's like all Elton John songs. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is pretty good. <laughs> Just, I, I was ill prepared for it. I was like, I'd never been in like the gay zone before. <laughs> I was like, whoa. You know, the great thing about it, I realized, because we, we're all selfish creatures, like, no one's going to hit on me. This is great. I, I totally feel like everyone knew I wasn't gay, you know? I'm so, I never felt so heterosexual in my whole life. There should be more gay places where I can go and just be like, I'm probably the only hetero here. <clears throat> Perhaps homophobes <coughs> are people who feel the need to reinforce their sense of being straight. You with a paranoid illusion that the world is going to increase with so many homosexuals that it's just going to crowd them out <laughs> and they're going to be at the center of the history be like i'm the last street dude left come on let's see what you got <laughs> get away from my ass <laughs> because the center of history is a hole it's a giant asshole right there it's also the center of the galaxy so now we're getting back into some serious holes. The Big Bang, there's a hole. That's holy. There's Jesus, there's the zero, there's the birth, right? It's his birthday, right? Zero, his, the first day of your life is zero, right? And then like the first second before that, the first second, like the emergence of Jesus is basically the single greatest creative act of God that completes his entire creation. It is the Genesis put into a single birth of a single person. It's not Adam and Eve, it's Jesus. Adam and Eve is just preparation, it's prehistory. The real purpose of the Bible is the birth of Jesus, at least from a non Jewish perspective. I mean, if Jesus came back, Jews would be like, oh, that's the first coming. Welcome, Messiah. It'd be like, get away, Christians. Like, you're acting like you, you were waiting for this. Like, it's the second time. It's not the second coming. This is the first time the Messiah has appeared. I think we would know. He's one of us. Now, come on in, Jesus. There'll be no loincloths and crucifixions here. <laughs> Those are for the goy. <laughs> now, if you think if your whole world turns around the sun we talked about galileo of the zero of history and the, the torture of jesus which is 33 years later offset from his birth but is actually conflated with his birth as the central what the axle the central cross of the universe so the zero is also the cross the zero and the cross. Instead, on the pause button, you have the zero. And on your computers and stuff, you might, we don't have so much anymore, but power buttons have a, a line through a circle and a zero and a one. Which is the number two. Jesus, in this sense, is the identity of the central principle of time. And even the countervailing force to death itself, who has taken on and conquered all death. Right? Christians would be happy with that interpretation, right? Because that is what the hero does. He takes on all of the identity and the guilt of whatever death came into the world and why it came into the world and he becomes the death that came into the world and then he's punished for the death that came into the world and then new life comes into the world so he's really the hope of history and not the pall over the very living essence of our own mother tongues 
He would be like the solution, not the evil. And there he is hanging there. There's your solution, your final solution. If he's going to take on death and do all these things, we're going to have to kill him. <laughs> hey, Jesus. Yeah, man. He took on death. The meaning of death, the curse of death, the woe of death, the curse of Eve, and everything else in between. Yeah. We're going to have to kill him. <laughs> going to have to feel what death feels like in the worst possible way. Of course, many other people are going to feel that, too. But yours is going to be the only important one. And you don't have to die, because we're just going to switch you off with some poor, skanky dude who happens to look like you, because all you skinny bastards look the same. Especially after we stick them in a hole for three weeks. It's not like they're taking DNA to know that that is Jesus on the cross. It's not like there's a scene where, like, Pontius Pilate or fucking John the fucking shish kebab fucking identifies him or identifies his body. We don't have any CSIs here. You can do anything in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, it's like Las Vegas. <laughs> you can write whatever you want. Mary's there. The women are like, What is it? What is it, Mary? The stone moves. <laughs> That's all the special effects I can give. Man, what a moment that must have been. Mary, steal yourself. <laughs> what is that? And then they look at her and she's like, she's been drinking all night. She's like, Jesus! <laughs> Jesus! Mary. <laughs> he prophesied he would come back to <laughs> Your face would be twisted like Jean Claude Van Damme in Bloodsport. <laughs> He'd be like, hey, Mom. <laughs> you got any more bagels? <laughs> I had to wait till the right moment, so I was playing ring toss on myself. It's all good. Mm, 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 mm. Sure, the human mind might have a kind of lingering stigmata, but other than that, I got a clean bill of health. Don't worry, that torture is so, like, three days ago. I'm ready to go. Let's go meet the guys. <laughs> God's miracles are endless. <laughs> what did you do? I healed myself. You can do all that, but your father couldn't prevent you from being crucified in a land with virtually no literacy? <laughs> and he's the lawyer of the universe? Like, well, it was meant to be. You see, all these people, mother, they will be evinced of something that they otherwise would never be evinced of, which gives us power over them. Yes, my son. Oh, incredible power. Think what we can do. We can rule the world. <laughs> he gives a speech worthy of Macbeth. Because, of course, there's no pulp fiction where someone fakes their death in order to get kinds of leverage over other people. There's actually been, I think, magnum PIs where someone fakes their death so they can see when, how their loved ones feel about them. Ross on Friends tells his alumni page that he's dead because he wants to see if people really care about him. And then the greatest part is that even he comes out of the room and they see he's alive, they're not that surprised because they didn't really care that he was dead. And he's obviously a pathological liar.
No, while while there may not be a lot of people who come back from the dead in our stories, well, kind of, you know, Moriarty do. There are a lot of char characters who lie ferociously. There's this guy in this TV show we're watching, and this doctor is unconscious from something, and he slips a ring on her finger while she's sleeping. And when she wakes up, he's like telling her about how, you know, she had uh, accepted his proposal of marriage, but she doesn't remember, right? But at some point, she says to him, "This doesn't feel right," and she and she breaks it off. So even though she doesn't know about the lie, she keeps talking about how her instincts, my instincts, I just, you know, take care of it. My instincts tell me this isn't the right thing. Isn't that fascinating? That's very well written, you know? I like that. A woman having instincts that no matter what some filthy psycho does, she knows that, she doesn't know, she doesn't even think something's wrong. She just knows it's wrong for her. You know, that was really, really neat. And then some dude interferes and says, he's lying to you. She says, fuck off. I don't care. I don't need your help. Right? Let women, let, let, let them and children use their instincts. You help them when they need it. You don't deprive them of help, but you don't always rush in to solve all their problems. Because we need to learn to use our instincts. Like, get away, because if I don't learn to use these, nothing else will matter. You're not always going to be there for me. You know, we don't have three or four psychological bodyguards saying, hey, watch out for that dude. He's skeevy. Imagine going to buy a car with like four angels who actually love you. This man is a filthy, he's a filthy liar. Abominations on me. <laughs> bail fire, bail fire. It's like, and you have to switch it off. You're like, just a second, I have to switch off my evil alert system. Click. <laughs> yes. Now about that car. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to switch off your instincts to engage with Western world. It's like, you know, here's your latte. Oh, we forgot the milk and it's got cow piss in it. But we're sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, not, not that people don't get our drinks right every day. And thank you for that, by the way. I really do. I love service people. You know, but... Um, Things happen, and we're not allowed to, you know, conk someone over the head or toss coffee in their face. <laughs> not that you have to really restrain yourself, but there are things you have to do. There's always going to be something. Isn't that great? Like, that's what makes a life interesting. The things that, like, you didn't think you'd ever have to exercise that type of restraint, but you did. <laughs> but you're nice, and you're polite, and people push it. They just... There's going to be some elephant in the herd that's just going to, like, start backing his ass into you. And you're like, <laughs> eventually you got to push back, which means sticking your hand up his ass. And he's like, you motherfucker. And it sets up a bit of a conflict. <laughs> yeah. Don't watch out. It's like if you're walking through the forest and you're like, hey, this is great. And then all of a sudden there's some thorns wrapped around your leg or your ankle or something. You're like, hey, what's this shit? And it's like, well, you didn't pay attention. You can have a bitch about it or you can learn. Untangle yourself. There was a time when I would never go any place with thorns. Other times I'll just, it doesn't deter me. You just have to be more careful. And the good thing about thorns when you like hiking around forests is that if you find some place in the thorns, a pretty good chance no one else is gonna follow you. Thorns are great for protecting little magical places. You know, you notice that most white people don't need many inhibitions not to go somewhere. Like, they have these signs, there's a saltwater marsh, and they have a few signs, like, don't step on the grass or something. 
But it's like, you don't need the science. None of these people are ever going to walk out here. I do. None of these people are ever going to. They just don't give a shit. It, it's, it's too lumpy. It's too wet. They don't like it. They don't like being off the path. White people do not like going off the path. They hate going off the path. They hate anything different. Anything that doesn't revolve around the number zero. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, ooh. Zero is the hero. And zero is the sun. The sacrificial sun. The pall over the father. The death of the father. Right? Once you go through the level of like, this is all good for you. This is all good for you, and every qualm you could have about it is actually because it is dealing with the ultimate evil of all human existence. So, yeah, Jesus puts a pall of evil all over him. Yeah, I mean, you could sniff Jesus and go, what is that? He's like, don't worry. Uh, you know, every Indian guru is eating evil and processing it for you. Buddhists and uh, medical Qigong are like... You take the evil and then you let it go. You take the black energy and you let it go. You breathe in the crap and you breathe out the light. You know, and it's it's ridiculous, <laughs> really. You know? These magical abilities to process shit. And uh, so don't worry if it's all over us. It's okay, don't worry how much we drink and how many people we hit with our cars, you know? We're processing all of that. You know? We're just breathing out the light. Sir, you hit a family of five people and killed them. That's okay. I'm just in a very positive place. Group psychology is different than individual psychology. People are not Christians because of coming to that conclusion as sovereign, psychological, individual, healthy people. No one ever became a Christian all by themselves. No one. No child ever grew up on the earth and said, gee, I like to worship a guy in a loincloth being tortured on a cross in a way that is conflated with his emergence out of his mother's pie hole. And that is the genesis of every joy that ever sprang from the earth in the name of my fucking father, the son. A child did that. You know, I guess Christians would be like, whoa, he's ahead of the game right there. He's Jesus. Maybe that's how Jesus would behave. You know, just in our DNA, like, that's everything, man, you got it. Just keep that going in every fucking thing that you do. When you're in Hinduism, it's like, everything you do has to be about your mantra. Your mantra is like your whole life, your whole will, your whole dharma, your whole cognition, every single moment of your life and its existence is only meaningful because ultimately it's absorbed in the universal mind of an endless bliss known as Brahma or Bliss Ananda. The only time any religion acknowledges any basic, perfect energy of the universe is when everything you do is supposed to blend into it and worship it at the same time. God forbid you should fucking think about what it really means without the chitter-chat of all the fucking religions who want you, your dick, your money, and your faith for the rest of eternity. All because they love you. <laughs> all based on love. Innocence, trust, faith, beautiful things, not ugly things. They don't make you worship a piece of shit. They don't say, hey, go eat poison and die because you'll get to heaven quicker. But some of their stories are about that. Hey, kill yourself if you love me. Romeo and Juliet. Love is something that makes you want to kill yourself. Love is fleeting. Love is deadly. Love is short. Love's labors can be lost. Sacrifice. Ruin. And homicide comes out of love. A TV show, there's a heart surgeon who kills herself because the other heart surgeon won't love her. You know? Fucking cuts her own neck. Just think of the crazy shit that people do, at least in theater, because of love. It makes people do crazy shit. Love makes us all crazy. Crazy or full of shit. 
waste products. I think collectively, if humans don't think correctly collectively, then that's a difficult statement to make because how can you say that people don't think correctly collectively? That's why no one ever puts up a good reason to not have a war because you can't say that people are thinking badly collectively. But you'll notice that whenever people think collectively, they almost always think badly. <laughs> so this makes you not want to think collectively at all. And then you don't, and then it's like, holy shit, you think very differently than everyone thinks they're thinking because they're thinking collectively even when they're thinking individually. Right? Because they're weak, and weak people think with the herd. That's how the world is ruled. Right? And it's fine for humans. We, humans are most weak in numbers. We say there's strength in numbers, but if you want to gather, maybe, when you want to gather up the most weakness in the world, do that with numbers. They're numbers. They're things that make you weak. Your alphabet is an alphabet, right? Which is two different words for death. Language is two different words for torture. Marriage is the marriage of two different words for torture, right? The whole idea of age and aging is that you're supposed to program yourself to suffer more as you grow. And that the economy that grows is the only thing that grows. And the only way it grows is that people know more suffering. And there's more debt. Think about it. Think about the pathology of all of our economic systems. It's all Christianized. It's all Roman Catholic. It's all fascist. All the time, 24 hours a day. And then they've given this idea of pluralism. Like you have some fucking choice. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, you can sit in your bathtub and experience the magic of the Las Vegas of the celestial casino of God's fucking creation. Yay! <laughs> Who let the dogs out? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Love is a hole at the center of time where you put all your hope. You better hope that that hole into which Jesus goes to eat all the shit and sin of time and come out and say it's, it's no thing like the spring and in honor of his great gift you celebrate representative public torture, humiliation, and death of your favorite biblical character and you think that's okay. You think that's all the story you tell yourself on the surface of your mind and you say down deep in your heart it's all okay and I would like to look Christians in the eyes and say do you really fucking believe at every level of your physical being that this is all on the up and up and if the answer is yes then you're done you know great you go on to heaven we, we there's no constructive conversation and that is the power of group psychology that's the power of cults and every Christian who looks me in the eyes and says, I'm absolutely okay with the Christian story in every possible sense. It is the reality of the highest, most transcendent Lord and the hope of all human history, without a doubt. Not a shred of evil on it, even though it has to take on all evil and every single atom of evil and then emerge blameless from it at the risk of drawing all of time and history around it in order to satisfy what it or evil needs. And sense is doing everything that evil could possibly want and then saying, trust me. And you're like, Lord, you're doing, it's like a father breaking in on a pedophile fucking you and going and, you know, and saying, don't worry, everything's happening to my perfect plan. If you say, hey, dad, everything you're doing in your life is attracting more crime and death, that's how you know I'm your real daddy. The world is just full of crime and death. Don't worry, it'll work out in the end. You see, because in this way of thinking, it's always going to work out in the end. The more violence and shit that swirls around, because all of time is Jesus gathering every fucking evil unto himself and he's convincing you that the only way he's doing that is to relieve you of it because it's really all your fault. So if you suffer for it, you have to. He's suffering. He's suffering for it and he doesn't have to, which is the only way he can successfully suffer being risking looking at the center of all evil 
and attracting all of it to himself. And being the only person who really does suffer from it, your suffering compared to which is not nearly as valuable or real as his. Be it all the currency of the world and your suffering the currency of an evil that beggars belief, don't worry, Jesus has you covered. He looks exactly the same, and everything looks the same, but this spot of Jesus in your mind says, don't worry. What a, it's using the intelligence of your own subconscious. You see that? It's extreme. So if you talk to someone in a cult, you're talking to like the human immune system. It's convinced it's all in as a child. Clunk, clunk, clunk. You'll never get in there. It's a perfect prison for their mind. You can never, it is always, no matter what you point out, it's like just gonna come back like the Northern Lights. It's created actually like a synthetic world system for the entire energy of that Christian. You're seeing something you're not supposed to see. We're seeing something we're not supposed to see. That the real prison is in the energy of a completely convinced fundamentalist Christian. That should tell us something about how the world is completely run. You start, you can't really have this conversation with them, right? Because their defense systems are too, you know, it's very consistent. And you don't want to abuse people, right? To convince a Christian that they're actually in a cult, that'd be abusive. I wouldn't want to do that. Because, I mean, you have all your work ahead of you to prove that that cult, even if it is a cult, you know, among the world of cults, is somehow any worse than any other cult. I mean, it's all pretty much the same. It's like, right. They're just a special version of a general problem. Because the world doesn't have to have a billion Christians. We've all been Christianized. Christianity today is just an artifact of just a stop along the way to Christianizing the planet. You didn't have to convert. You're born converted now. <laughs> you, you, when you pretend you watch TV and play with yourself, you've converted to the religion of the world. Everyone's a Christian. You know, the thing about Christians is that they're not really so special anymore. We're all Christian. We've all been Christianized. I have no choice. You know, Christians like, hey man, you're saying this, but you have to be a Christian no matter what. You're right, I do, in a sense. But I can never completely be one, and nor could you, and that's what keeps the world going. Because no one can ever be enough, and man can never do enough, and no one's ever going to find the solution, and no one can work enough, and you can't love enough, and think enough, and we can't make enough fucking YouTube videos if billion people with 200 IQ sat down and made videos about what they thought people should think about life and what they should do every day to make it a better place than it is when everything we fucking do is never going to fucking accomplish that if we keep thinking the same way that we're thinking. Nobody wants to tackle that. It's too much fucking work. It's too much fucking work. Let Thoreau do it. You know? There are people who will spend all summer in a fire tower in northern Canada just watching for fires. They'll do that for money but they won't think for themselves. They don't come down enlightened. And notice too, in my arguments for or against Christianity, that I haven't proven that Christianity is completely wrong. I've said that now, ultimately, the Satanists, or me, and the Christians are set up in two, very strong energy fields related to our basic physical constitution of how we protect our personal sense of what is sacred and real about the universe. It allows us to indulge our feelings and thoughts such as they are our own and those which we would commend others to listen to or to hear or to bemoan, but yet still sacred unto themselves. For we can expect that not all people are going to respond well to the wonderful sanctities of a mind adequately commended to its own particular orbit of the giant drain around which all things circle. Trust me, the universe has been flushed and I'm probably moving like every other little deuce in the giant galaxy of our existence. And, and no doubt, I will be thoroughly represented at the giant uh, escape of all the shit of the universe at the end of time. A few of my molecules or a few pieces of feces that used to be Rain Griffin, I'm sure will be sucked out as an envelope at the end of existence or back into the Big Bang from whence we came. You know, my flesh has been spoken for. My life is given to the earth. It belongs to her, you see. So 
your God's going to have to talk to her first. Because I want to live a long time. And our minds are not at war with each other, but it's like, I don't think the way Christians do. I don't have to be so reverent, you know? You know, Jews are better that way. They can use their mind. They don't think of that as being evil, questioning everything about God and the universe that they're in. Like, they can, they don't spend their time doing that, and they certainly don't spend their time doing what I'm doing. But it's like, to be a smart people, you have to encourage your children to think for themselves. Otherwise, you wouldn't survive. The Inuit wouldn't survive. The Jews wouldn't have survived history. Like, and, you know, they, they have to have a particular way of using your mind and honoring the basic principles of family, life, and logos. I mean, I mean, it, it's, not a, it's not a YouTube video. It's a very profound genetic heritage. That's why Jews don't have a lot of videos quibbling about little points of biblical war. Because it's in their fucking blood. <laughs> you know? And they get to decide what it all means every fucking day of their life. Because that's called fucking freedom. And if you want to say that your entire uh, Bible and Torah is just a piece of shit written by scribes who were working for the most powerful wizards of the time that had a mandate to control the human mind, oh, God forbid. You know? There's two things that can start to converge, and they probably have to in the energy fields of mass existence in every civilization on Earth. Is when you think about the power of your mind, and the likelihood that that mind, as it becomes more powerful in your own imagination, has come under the good regulation of all kinds of people who know how fucking powerful your mind was before you were born. You see what I mean? You have to consider both those things. And that finds the horizon of what I call your celestial biology. You can't expand your mind without having room to think about a world that might be interested in inhibiting its expansion. You, don't, you never get an education, but there's something there to retard the development of your mind. There is retardation in all education. In every philosophy of peace, there is war. In every war, people attribute some level of collective and tribal survival that runs consistently with that of the energy of peace. That once disturbed, war is the natural result until peace is restored. Is an immunological function enjoyed or suffered or manipulated across millions of human beings all over the earth? Why would we deny anyone at least the emotions that were consistent? You know? That you might say you could understand war as if someone hurt you or killed a member of your family and there were no other means of redress. What would humans have done? Or, uh, could we imagine other social systems where there was much lower amount of murder and where they dealt with the murder that was very differently so that the decreasing crime and how you dealt with it somehow in our imaginary culture would, would converge upon a way of life that might have all kinds of other factors that might be worth learning about. And where do you learn that? And what thought factory of the human mind is that educated? Because so much is retarded in our mind, we never even get a chance to think about it. Books, fantasy, religion, right? Because the same part of your mind you use to lick Jesus from crevice to crack, right, is being so occupied you can't do that. So it's not even that a belief system is so bad but that for some reason, humans put so much of their brain function into it, they can't fucking think at the same level or about anything else. You don't have to be religious to be using your brain. You know? And Jews discovered that too. There are a lot of Christians, educated or not, who think that the best use of their brain is when they're being Christian. <laughs> you know? You know? What if you could just use your brain whenever you want, and then come home to being Christian. And those people would be like physicists and doctors. You can be Christian and still come home and be Christian and still use your brain to do other things. Amazing. Imagine if you left your thought level at the loincloth of Jesus. There was a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses on this TV show who were praying that their son wouldn't die. Um, 
um, because if he got a blood transfusion uh, during surgery of any kind, he would have to go to hell, which was like a physically like demented, awful, terrifying thing that they would never want to happen to him. I don't know if they're Jehovah's Witness or what they are. Sorry about that, JWs. But... And uh, they end up giving him the surgery and uh, they basically kiss him on the forehead and leave. They abandon him. That's it. Such is there. You're watching like fundamentalist religious faith. And when he wakes up and finds out they put that blood in him, he's just He's just absolutely mortified. He's just crying, terrible. Like he's lost everything that his whole life has ever been about. I've grown up with Christians. They're like, oh, I went away from the church, but I came back to the church. I've come back to my Christian walk. I'm sure every middle, half the middle-aged people in churches in North America are like, yeah, I strayed from the Lord and I partied with the devil and now I've come back, you know? I would love to do that. I'd go to a church and be like, I, I'm rain. <laughs> When I was young, I was christened in the Church of England. And then I strayed, for I wandered far across the many grass-strewn hills and valleys of our Lord. And yet I found no evidence of anything that indicated that the world should be filled with suffering to maximize the heroic qualities of some Jewish dude who doesn't mind being tortured in public. Never found that, you know? And I understand that it must be much more sophisticated than that, that I have reduced it to my childlike level while wandering the hills and downs of the universe of a heaven of a few square blocks that is all the celestial biology of a child needs to live in and prepare for the most wonderful fucking world that ever had such a blue sky and such beautiful colors and such beautiful fucking smells that you could spend the rest of your fucking life go out into a forest and go and it can just hit you full fucking frontal like the vagina of God and you're fucking content in parts of your body that you didn't even know you have that no other drink or drug in the world could possibly give you to let your deep deep fucking animal brain know hey you're home you're in the fucking woods man you're where you fucking belong <laughs> you know the smell of wood, the smell of the earth, for Christ's sake, you know, that's my fucking religion, you know, the nose knows, you know, you find your comfortable place in the world, you get your fucking cup of coffee, maybe you read your little daily, daily bread, there was this thing circulated, my dad was into it, he's like, called the Christian Daily Bread, and it's, this thing is very helpful, it lets you study verses and little things that you can do in like five or ten minutes, you know, Oh, you know, Christianity has been about education, you know. Um, you know, the residential school system in Canada was run by Christians, you know. They were all about the education, weren't they? Meeting out that wonderful, pure knowledge and God's love to all those Native children. Mm, 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 mm. That's why they're also happy about the results, you know. You know, I've never gotten, seen anyone get up in public anywhere and 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 move my heart to shame and make every white person in an entire theater bow their head who has gotten up and had the courage to say how angry they are about the canadian school system and what it did to their family can i just say that and that's a fact so take, think about that, too, while you're handing out your fucking beautiful, beatific education to the children of North America. And how fucking gold with the cistern at the bottom of the hellfire of the Lord, where the giblets of Jesus are stirred to the perfect loaming sound of the northern lights in the endless ranks of the eternal light-bearing fields of the soldiers of universal education. <laughs> it's like... The fuck you taught my mind. You didn't teach me how to talk this way, did you? You didn't teach me how to think this way, fucking teachers of North America, right? I'm not one of yours. You don't fucking own me, and you don't want to fucking own me. I'm sure none of my fucking teachers, not from kindergarten on, want to listen to this and say, yeah, I have a stake in his fucking mind, and I don't want you to. I fucking abdicate. Nothing like you, you cocksuckers could want to have any fucking pride. You have no fucking shame. How could you fucking take any pride 
in the working of my mind, but a fucking druid, a fucking druid who has some fucking knowledge about this fucking earth, they would have some fucking pride in me, like the fucking sun, which is the shield of the Lord fucking Satan that fucks your God up the ass every fucking day that a child has any fucking joy. The bird, every time a bird fucking sings, it's in spite of your fucking ugly God. The beauty of the heavens and the earth, that's what Satan is. That's in my mother's blood. The fuck you have any passion? You're busy killing children with loincloths on a cross and then sprinkling chocolate little fucking ass donuts for them to pick up so they can fucking become oriented to life. That's your little education. That's so fucking allegorical, isn't it? I'm sure someone on the battlefields of the wars of the world will think back. They'll have a flashback in the movie. They're like, and then there was the chocolate egg. Jesus looking down going, eat it. It's okay. I have given it. It comes out of my ass like the blood and the wine. It's a sacrament, right? It's a sacrament. It kind of sounds like excrement, but it's got a sack in it. It's like sacoia. Eat it. It's good. It's sweet. It's sugars. will tempt thee into a life of intoxication and excitement. And if you're lucky, at the high pitches of group excitement and catharsis and the groaning of labor and the chatterboxes of the delightful sociopaths on the radios on our way to commute our life sentence, it will reach a pinnacle of such bliss as will pound out of every radio station of your life, as will sound on the lips of every politician. It will glow with the nuclear glory and love of every television set and every synergy of the world, and every speech and every bomb and every triage unit and every scream of every soldier and every child. And the words of Anne Frank will proclaim the name of our Lord. <laughs> doing for time <laughs> that's my producer my benefactor and the governess of my life my mother so you know those are some of my opinions on stuff <laughs> so, this is why yes I'm coming Thank you, my mother, my queen. <laughs> okay. ah. So there you go. That's what I think about stuff. Mm -hmm. I have to go. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about some more stuff. Thanks for listening.